Hi, I'm Kathy and welcome to Kids Create. Our theme for this month is uh, for Labor Day and it's about people that help us and, and, and different jobs and work. So I hope you enjoy. So there are lots of people that whose jobs help us, but we also are helped by our friends and our family. And this poem here is called I'll Be There. And it's actually lyrics from a song um, by Alan and Marilyn uh, Bergman. So I'll be there. I'll be there when you, whenever the world seems far too wide. Though you may not always see me, I'm right there by your side. When you're frightened and pull up the covers, though it's only a creaky stair, if the rainbows fade, don't be afraid, for I promise you I'll be there. When the shadows come and moonlight paints pictures on the wall and you're feeling lost and lonely like no one cares at all, when you can't chase the demons inside you and it's more than a soul can bear, you must never fear, they will disappear. Look around and I'll be there. There'll be times when friends desert you and life may let you down. And those moments leave you feeling like a circus just left town. You just tell me if there's anything hurts you, I'll make it right, I swear. Sure as rainbows bend, my forever friend, I can promise you I'll be there. A kiss and a smile, then a dream for a while. You'll wake up and I'll be there. So work and workers aren't people just that help you. We can also be workers and workers. And this poem by Shel Silverstein is called Helping. Agatha Fry. She made a pie, and Christopher John helped bake it. Christopher John, he mowed the lawn, and Agatha Fry helped rake it. Zachary Zug took out the rug, and Jennifer Joy helped shake it. And Jennifer Joy, she made a toy, and Zachary Zug helped break it. And some kind of help is the kind of help that helping is all about. And some kind of help is the kind of help we all can do without. So working and jobs can help us and help others, but also just working by itself is something that makes us feel good. And this is a poem by Henry Van Dyke. Let me do my work from day to day in field or forest, at desk or loom, in roaring marketplace or tranquil room. Let me but find it in my heart to say when vagrant wishes beckon me astray. This is my work, my blessing, not my doom. Of all who live, I'm the one by whom this work can best be done in the right way. Then shall I see it not too great nor small to suit my spirit and prove my powers. Then shall I cheerful greet the laboring hours and cheerful turn when the long shadows fall at evening tide to play and love and rest because I know for me my work is best. So we do our work and hopefully we enjoy our work and do our best. But what kind of work do you think you want to do? Well, some people know from when they're very, very small, what they want to do. And this book called Ada Twist Scientist by Audrey Beatry talks about a little girl who wanted to be a scientist from when she was very little. Ada Marie, Ada Marie said not a word till the day she turned three. She bounced in her crib and looked all around observing the world, but not making a sound. She learned how to climb and made her big break with a trail of chaos left in the wake. She ran through the day chasing each sound and sight and didn't slow down till she conked out at night. Her parents were frazzled but tried not to freak 
as Ada grew bigger and still did not speak. Clearly, young Ada, with lots in her head, would have something to say when it ought to be said. That's just what happened when Ada turned three. She tore through the house on a fact-finding spree and climbed up the clock just as high as she could. Her parents yelled, stop, as all good parents would. Ada's chin quivered, but she did not cry. She took a deep breath and simply asked, why? Why does it tick and why does it talk and why don't we call it a granddaughter clock? Why are these pointy things stuck to a rose and why are there hairs inside of your nose? She started with why and then what, how, when. By bedtime, she came back to why once again. She drifted to sleep as her dazed parents smiled at curious thoughts of their curious child who wanted to know what the world was about. They kissed, they kissed her and whispered, you'll figure it out. Why, what, how, when, where? Her parents kept up with her, their high-flying kid whose questions and chaos both grew as she did. Even Miss Greer found her hands were quite full when young Ada's chaos wreaked havoc at school. But this was clear about Miss Ida Twist. She had all the traits of a good scientist. Ada was busy the first day of spring testing the sounds that the mockingbirds sing when a horrible stench whacked her right in the nose, a pungent aroma that curled up her toes. Zowie said Ada, which got her to thinking, what is the source of this terrible stinking? How does a nose know there's something to smell? And does it still stink if, no one, if there's no nose to tell? She rattled off questions and tapped on her chin. She'd start at the start, where she ought to begin. A mystery, a riddle, a puzzle, a quest. This was the moment that Ada loved best. Ada did research to learn all she could of smelling of and smells, both stinky and good. One hypothesis Ada thought could be true, the terrible stink came from Dad's cabbage stew. She tested and tested, but soon Ida knew it was time to come up with hypothesis too. Then Zowie the stink struck again, just like that. Hypothesis too. It's caused by the cat. The cat couldn't make such a stink on its own. It needed perfume and some fancy cologne. So young Ada tested. The test was a flop. She started again, but her parents yelled, stop! Ada Marie, Ada Marie, to the thinking chair now. By the time we count three. Enough, said her mother. That's it, said her dad. Her parents were frustrated, frazzled, and mad. Why, Ada questions. Her mother said, no. What, Ada queried. Her father said, go. You've ruined our supper. You've made the cat stink. Enough of your questions. Now sit there and think. She looked at her parents. Her heart turned to goo. Poor Ada Twist didn't know what to do. She sat all alone by herself in the hall and Ada, once more, could say nothing at all. And so Ada sat and she sat and she sat and she thought about science and stew and the cat and how her experiments made such a mess. Does it have to be so? Is that part of success? Are messes a problem? And while she was thinking, what was the source of that terrible stinking? Ada Marie did what scientists do. She asked a small question and then she asked two and each of those led her to Three questions more, and some of those questions resulted in four. As Ada got thinking, 
She really dug in. She squibbled her questions and tapped on her chin. She started at why and then what, how, and when. At the end of the hall, she reached why once again. Her parents calmed down and they came back to talk. They looked at the hallway and just had to gawk. No patch of bare paint could be seen on the wall. The thinking chair now was the great thinking hall. They watched their young daughter and sighed as they did. What would they do with this curious kid who wanted to know what the world was about? They smiled and whispered, we'll figure it out. And that's what they did, because that's what you do when your kid has a passion and a heart that is true. They remade their world. Now they're all in the act of helping young Ada sort fiction from fact. She asked lots of questions. How could she resist? It's all in the heart of a young scientist. And as for that smell, oh, what can Ada Twist do but learn all she can with her friends in grade two? Will they discover the stink that curls toes? Well, that is the question. And someday, who knows? Audrey Beatry, now her job is being a writer and a poet. And she's written several books about things that people do. She, she has Ada Twist, scientist, and Iggy Peck, architect, and Rosie Revere, engineer. So I hope you enjoyed all these and I hope you think about things that you like to do and all the people and be thankful for all the things that people do for you. So thank you and I will see you next time. Bye.